Hello, and welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's webinar on Regulation C and the amendments made by the Bureau in 2015. This is the second in a series of HMDA-related webinars that the Bureau will present to help institutions understand and comply with the rule. If you missed the first webinar, where we provided an overview of the HMDA final rule and effective dates, we've provided a link to it below. In today's webinar, we will discuss identifiers, including entity, applications or loans, property, and loan originator. In addition, we will discuss data points related to applicants and borrowers. Before we begin, we need to let you know that this presentation is not a substitute for the rule. We cannot amend the rule by webinar. Although efforts have been made to ensure the accuracy of this webinar's content, the rule and its official interpretations provide the complete and definitive information regarding the requirements. Throughout this webinar, we refer to the official interpretations either generally as commentary or as individual comments. This presentation is current as of February 3rd, 2017. Now let's begin with identifiers. The 2015 HMDA final rule requires that all financial institutions report their legal entity identifier, known as the LEI, prescribed in section 1003.4A1, Romanet 1A, of the final rule beginning with their HMDA data collected in 2018 to be submitted to the appropriate federal agency by March 1, 2019. The LEI replaces the entity identifier in the reporter's identification number. The LEI is a 20-digit code issued by a utility endorsed by the LEI Regulatory Oversight Committee or endorsed or governed by the Global LEI Foundation. To obtain an LEI, visit the Global LEI Foundation's website at www.gleif.org. For implementation purposes, a financial institution may want to consider obtaining the LEI as early as possible, because as we will discuss in the next section, the LEI is a critical component of the Universal Loan Identifier known as the ULI. A financial institution will need its LEI number in order to create a ULI for each application received, for each covered loan it originates, and, where applicable, purchase covered loans. All covered loans and applications reported on your HMDA submission must include a universal loan identifier known as the ULI prescribed in Section 1003.4 A1 Romanet 1 of the Final Rule. What is a ULI? A ULI is an identifier that can be used to identify and retrieve the covered loan or application file. The ULI contains three components. The first component is a financial institution's LEI. The second component represents a set of up to 23 characters assigned by the financial institution to identify the covered loan or application. The characters can be letters or numerals, or a combination of letters and numerals. These characters must be unique within the financial institution and must not include information that could be used to directly identify the applicant or borrower. The third component is a check digit, which we will discuss in a moment. What does unique mean for the purposes of the ULI? It means that the ULI is unique within the institution and used only for the covered loan or application. A financial institution should assign only one ULI to any covered loan or application, and each ULI should correspond to a single application an ensuing loan in the case that the application is approved and a loan is originated. As mentioned, the ULI must not contain information that could be used to directly identify the borrower or applicant. This includes, but is not limited to, the applicant or borrower's name, date of birth, 
social security number, government issued driver's license, passport number, alien registration number, or employer or taxpayer identification number. For a purchase covered loan, the financial institution reports the ULI that was assigned by the institution that originated the loan. In some instances, a ULI may not have been assigned by the institution that originated the loan. This could occur if the institution that originated the loan was not subject to Regulation C at the time the loan was originated, or the loan is originated prior to the effective date of this provision, which is January 1, 2018. In these instances, the financial institution that purchases a loan assigns a ULI using its LEI and assigns a sequence of characters to identify the covered loan or application and generates a check digit. Speaking of the check digit, the third and last component of the ULI is a check digit, which represents the two rightmost characters. Appendix C of the 2015 HMDA final rule provides the requirements for generating the check digit. Section 1003.4A9 requires that the financial institution report information about property location for the property securing the covered loan or proposed to secure the covered loan in the case of an application. Section 1003.4A9 Romanet 1 provides that the property address must be reported and Section 1003.4A9 Romanet 2 provides that if the property is located in a metropolitan statistical area or metropolitan division in which a financial institution has a home or branch office or if the institution is subject to the Community Reinvestment Act, the financial institution must also report the state, county, and census tract. Census tract is reported if the property is located in a county with a population of 30,000 or more according to the U.S. Census Bureau's most recent decennial census. Note that beginning with the 2018 data collection, census tract is a full 11-digit number, which also contains the state and county codes. The financial institution reports only the property location information for the property that is taken as security even if the covered loan relates to more than one property. If, however, more than one property is taken as security or proposed to be taken as security, then the financial institution reports one of the properties taken as a security that contains a dwelling. The property address should correspond to the property identified on the legal obligation related to the covered loan. If an application did not result in an origination, the financial institution reports the location of the property proposed to secure the loan as identified by the applicant. The financial institution reports the physical location of the property as securing the loan or proposed to secure the loan. Information related to the physical location of the property are the street address, city name, state name, and zip code. If the property address is not known or the applicant did not provide the property address before the application was denied, withdrawn, or closed for incompleteness, the financial institution reports that the requirement is not applicable. Section 1003.4A34 requires that the financial institution report the mortgage loan originator's unique identifier assigned by the Nationwide Mortgage Licensing System and Registry. This unique identifier is also known as the NMLSR ID. It is assigned to individuals registered or licensed through the National Mortgage Licensing System and Registry to provide loan originating services. If there is more than one mortgage loan originator involved in a transaction, the financial institution reports the NMLSR ID of the individual mortgage loan originator that had primary responsibility for the transaction as of the date of action taken. 
If a mortgage loan originator has not been assigned or is not required to obtain an NMLSR ID, the financial institution reports that the requirement is not applicable. Let's move on to applications. First, let's discuss pre-approval requests. In the first webinar, we discussed that requests under certain pre-approval programs are considered applications under HMDA and are therefore reportable. Section 1003.4A4 requires that the financial institution report whether the application or covered loan involved a request for a pre-approval of a home purchase loan under such a pre-approval program. Section 1003.2B provides that an application that contains a request for a pre-approval is one where the application is reviewed under a program which the financial institution performs a comprehensive analysis of the applicant's credit worthiness and then issues a written commitment to the applicant that is valid for a period of time to extend a home purchase loan up to a certain amount. The written commitment may not be subject to conditions other than conditions that require the identification of a suitable property, conditions that require no material change has occurred in the applicant's credit worthiness or financial condition prior to closing, and limited conditions that are not related to the financial condition or credit worthiness of the applicant that the institution traditionally attaches to home mortgage applications. If the application or covered loan involved a request under such a pre-approval program, the financial institution reports it under Section 1003.4A4. If an application or covered loan did not involve a request for a pre-approval under such a pre-approval program, the financial institution reports that the application or covered loan did not involve a pre-approval request, regardless of whether the institution has such a program and the applicant did not apply through that program, or the institution does not have such a pre-approval program. Certain types of applications and covered loans are always reported as not involving a request for a pre-approval. For all of the following, a financial institution reports that the application or covered loan did not involve a pre-approval request. Number one, purchase covered loans. Number two, open-end lines of credit or applications for an open-end line of credit. Number three, reverse mortgages or applications for a reverse mortgage. Number four, applications that are denied. Number five, applications that are closed for incompleteness. Number six, applications that were withdrawn by the applicant. Number seven, applications or covered loans for any purpose other than a home purchase loan. And number eight, a covered loan for home purchase secured by a multifamily dwelling or an application for such a loan. For institutions that are current HMDA reporters, there is a change in this reporting requirement that we need to point out. Previously, there was a distinction between reporting that a pre-approval was not requested and reporting that the requirement was not applicable, such as when an institution does not have a pre-approval program. As part of the final rule, the Bureau changed this so that financial institutions should report pre-approval not requested in all circumstances where an application or covered loan did not involve a request under a pre-approval program. Reporting that the requirement is not applicable will no longer be an option. Let's talk about dates. First, we'll discuss the application date and then talk about action taken date. Section 1003.4A1 Romanet 2 requires that the financial institution report the date the application was received or the date shown on the application form. As discussed in the first webinar, Regulation C defines an application as an oral or written request for a covered loan that is made in accordance with procedures used by a financial institution for the type of credit requested. The application date is required for all covered loans and applications, except for purchase covered loans. The financial institution can choose to use the date the application was received or the date shown on the application form. However, it must generally be consistent in its approach. 
If the application was not submitted directly to the financial institution, the institution may choose one of the following. Report the date the application was received by the party that initially received the application, the date the application was received by the financial institution, or the date shown on the application form. Now let's talk about action taken date. Section 1003.4a8 Romanet 2 requires that the financial institution report the date of the action taken by the financial institution. For loan originations, including a pre-approval request that led to an origination, the financial institution reports the date of closing or account opening. If funds were dispersed on a later date than closing or account opening, the institution may report the date the funds were dispersed. For an origination that a financial institution acquires from another party that initially received the application, the financial institution reports either the closing or account opening date, or the date the institution acquires the application from the other party. For construction to permanent covered loans, the institution reports either the closing or account opening date, or the date the covered loan converts to the permanent financing. For withdrawn applications, the financial institution reports either the date the express withdrawal was received or the date shown on the notification form for a written withdrawal. For applications denied and files closed for incompleteness, the financial institution reports either the date the action was taken or the date the notice was sent to the applicant. For a covered loan that was purchased by the financial institution, the financial institution reports the date of the purchase. Now let's discuss the collection of ethnicity, race, and sex information of the applicant or borrower. Section 1003.4A10 Romanet 1 requires that financial institutions report the ethnicity, race, and sex of the applicant or borrower and whether the information was collected based on visual observation or surname. A financial institution may provide the questions regarding ethnicity, race, and sex on its loan application form or on a separate form that refers to the application. Appendix B of the 2015 HMDA Final Rule contains a sample data collection form. Whether the application is taken in person, by mail or by telephone, or on the internet, a financial institution must ask for the applicant's ethnicity, race, and sex, but cannot require the applicant to provide it. For an application that is taken by phone, the information stated on the loan application form or the separate form that refers to the application must be stated orally, unless the specific information is unique to applications taken in writing. An example of this is the italicized language provided in the sample data collection form in Appendix B of the 2015 HMDA Final Rule. Applicants must be informed that federal law requires race, ethnicity, and sex to be collected in order to protect consumers and monitor compliance with federal statutes that prohibit discrimination against applicants on these bases. For applications that are taken in person, applicants must be informed that if they do not provide the information, the financial institution is required to note the information based on visual observation or surname. If the applicant declines to answer these questions by checking the I do not wish to provide this information box on an application taken by mail or internet, or declines to provide the information on an application taken by telephone by stating that he or she does not wish to provide the information, then the financial institution must report information not provided by applicant in mail, internet, or telephone application. If an applicant begins an application by mail, internet, or by telephone, and the applicant does not provide the information, but does not check or select the I do not wish to provide this information box on the application, and the applicant subsequently meets with the financial institution in person to complete the application, then the financial institution must request the applicant's ethnicity, race, and sex. If during the in-person meeting, the applicant does not provide the information, then the information must be collected based on visual observation or surname. 
If the meeting occurs after the application process is complete, such as at account opening or closing, the financial institution is not required to obtain the applicant's ethnicity, race, and sex. If an applicant provides only some of the information requested, a financial institution reports the information the applicant provided. If an application is taken by mail, internet, or telephone, and an applicant provides some or all information related to ethnicity, race, and sex, but also checks the I do not wish to provide this information box on an application that is taken by mail or on the internet, or makes that selection when applying by telephone, the financial institution reports the information on ethnicity, race, and sex that was provided by the applicant. If an application is taken in person and the applicant chooses not to provide the information, note this fact on the collection form and then the financial institution must collect the applicant's ethnicity, race, and sex based on visual observation or surname. Applications that are accepted through electronic media with a video component are treated like applications taken in person. If an application is accepted through electronic media without a video component, then the application is treated like an application accepted by mail. Applicants must be provided the option of selecting more than one ethnicity or race. If an applicant selects more than one ethnicity or race, then the financial institution must report each selected designation within certain limits. For ethnicity, Hispanic or Latino and not Hispanic or Latino are the ethnicity categories. If an applicant selects Hispanic or Latino, the applicant may select up to four subcategories, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, or other Hispanic or Latino. A financial institution must report each aggregate ethnicity category and each ethnicity subcategory selected by the applicant. If an applicant selects the ethnicity subcategory, other Hispanic or Latino, the applicant may also provide a particular Hispanic or Latino ethnicity that is not listed in the standard subcategories. In such a case, the financial institution reports both the selection of other Hispanic or Latino and the additional information provided by the applicant. For race, there are five aggregate race categories. American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, Black or African American, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, and White. The Asian race category has seven subcategories. Asian Indian, Chinese, Filipino, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, and other Asian. The Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander race category has four subcategories. Native Hawaiian, Guamanian or Chamorro, Samoan, and other Pacific Islander. A financial institution must report every aggregate race category selected by the applicant. If the applicant also selects one or more race subcategories, a financial institution must report each race subcategory selected by the applicant, except that an institution must not report more than a total of five aggregate race categories and race subcategories combined. If an applicant selects the other Asian race subcategory or the other Pacific Islander race subcategory, the applicant may also provide a particular other Asian or other Pacific Islander race not listed in the standard subcategories. In either such case, the financial institution must report both the selection of other Asian or other Pacific Islander as applicable and the additional information provided by the applicant subject to the five race maximum. If there are no co-applicants, a financial institution reports that there is no co-applicant. If there is more than one co-applicant, the financial institution reports the ethnicity, race, and sex only for the first co-applicant listed on the application form. When would a financial institution report not applicable for ethnicity, race, and sex? A financial institution does not report this information for applicants or borrowers who are not natural persons. For example, a corporation, partnership, or trust. 
If the covered loan or application includes a guarantor, a financial institution does not report the guarantor's race, ethnicity, and sex. For purchase covered loans, if the financial institution chooses not to report the applicant or co-applicant's ethnicity, race, and sex, the financial institution reports that the requirement is not applicable. For detailed instructions on the collection of ethnicity, race, and sex, refer to Appendix B in the 2015 HMDA Final Rule. Comment 4A10, Romanet 1, provides that an application received prior to January 1, 2018, and where final action on that application occurs on or after January 1, 2018, the financial institution collects race, ethnicity, and sex in accordance with the requirements at the time the information was collected. For example, if an application was received on December 1, 2017 and collects the applicant's ethnicity, race, and sex on that date, but final action was not taken until January 1, 2018, the financial institution collects race, ethnicity, and sex according to the requirements in effect on December 1, 2017. On September 23, 2016, the Bureau issued an official approval notice concerning the collection of race and ethnicity under Regulation C for applications received in 2017. As we mentioned, for an application that is received before January 1, 2018, the financial institution collects race, ethnicity, and sex in accordance with the requirements in effect at the time the information was collected. The Bureau's official approval notice provides that at any time from January 1, 2017 through December 31, 2017, a creditor may, at its option, permit applicants to self-identify using disaggregated ethnic and racial categories provided in Appendix B to the 2015 HMDA Final Rule. Note that for an application received in 2017 and where final action is taken in 2017, the financial institution must report ethnicity and race information using only the aggregate codes listed in the Bureau's Filing Instructions Guide for data collected in 2017, even if the financial institution opts to permit applicants to self-identify using disaggregated ethnic and racial categories. For an application received in 2017 and where final action is taken in 2018 and the financial institution opts to permit applicants to self-identify using disaggregated ethnic and racial categories, the financial institution, at its option, may report ethnicity and race information using the disaggregated categories if the applicant provided it. Alternatively, the financial institution may follow the transition rule in comment 4A10 Romanet 1-2 in the 2015 HMDA final rule and report ethnicity and race information using the aggregate categories. For an application received in 2018 and beyond and where final action is taken in 2018 and beyond, the financial institution collects ethnicity and race information using the disaggregated categories discussed earlier. The financial institution must report ethnicity and race information using the disaggregated categories if the applicant provided it. In addition, the financial institution must report whether the information was collected based on visual observation or surname. The Bureau created this chart that you may use as a reference tool to illustrate the options that a financial institution has for collecting and reporting ethnicity and race information. This chart is available on the Bureau's Implementation and Guidance webpage. We provide the website address on this page. Let's walk through the chart. For an application received in 2017 or final action is taken in 2017, the financial institution may collect and report aggregate ethnicity and race data or collect disaggregated ethnicity and race data and then report aggregate ethnicity and race data. For an application received in 2017 
where final action is taken in 2018, the financial institution may collect aggregate and report aggregate ethnicity and race data, or collect disaggregated ethnicity and race data, and then report aggregate ethnicity and race data, or collect disaggregated ethnicity and race data, and then report disaggregated ethnicity and race data. For an application received in 2018 and beyond, where final action is taken in 2018 and beyond, the financial institution collects and reports disaggregated ethnicity and race data. Remember that Appendix B in current Regulation C requires a financial institution to note the ethnicity, race, and sex of an applicant for an application taken in person if the applicant chose not to furnish the information. Beginning with 2018 applications where final action is taken in 2018 and beyond, the financial institution must continue to note the ethnicity, race, and sex of an applicant for an application taken in person if the applicant chose not to provide the information. And, in addition, the financial institution must also now report whether the ethnicity, race, and sex were collected on the basis of visual observation or surname. One final thought. Only an applicant may self-identify using the disaggregated ethnicity and race categories. A financial institution cannot use disaggregated categories when collecting ethnicity and race information on the basis of visual observation or surname, but instead must select from the aggregate categories. Let's move on to age, credit score, income, and debt-to-income ratio. Section 1003.4A10 Romanet 2 requires that the financial institution report the applicant's age. Age is calculated as of the application date as the number of whole years based on the date of birth provided on the application form. If there are no co-applicants, the financial institution reports that there is no co-applicant. If there is more than one co-applicant, the financial institution reports the age for only the first co-applicant provided on the application form. A financial institution reports not applicable for age for the following. Number one, the covered loan was purchased by the financial institution and the institution chooses not to report the applicant or co-applicant's age. Number two, the applicant or co-applicant is not a natural person, such as a corporation, partnership, or trust. If the covered loan or application includes a guarantor, a financial institution does not report the guarantor's age. Section 1003.4A15 requires that the financial institution report the credit score or scores the financial institution relied on in making the credit decision. The financial institution also reports the name and version of the scoring model that was used to generate each credit score. First, what does relied on mean with respect to credit score? Comment 4A15-1 provides that a financial institution relies on a credit score in making the credit decision if the credit score was a factor in the credit decision, even if it was not a dispositive factor. For example, if the financial institution used the credit score as one of many factors in making the credit decision, then the financial institution relied on it, even if the financial institution denies the application on an underwriting factor other than the credit score. Second, what happens if the financial institution obtains or creates two or more credit scores for a single applicant or borrower? Comment 4A15-2 provides that when a financial institution obtains or creates two or more credit scores for a single applicant or borrower, but relies on only one score in making the credit decision, for example, by relying on the lowest, highest, most recent, or average of all the scores, the financial institution complies with Section 1003.4A15 by reporting that credit score and information about the scoring model used. What happens if the financial institution obtains or creates two or more credit scores for a single applicant or borrower, but relies on multiple credit scores in making the credit decision? 
Comment 4A15-2 explains that when a financial institution obtains or creates two or more credit scores for an applicant or borrower and relies on multiple scores for the applicant or borrower in making the credit decision, for example, by relying on a scoring grid that considers each of the scores obtained or created for the applicant or borrower without combining the scores into a composite score, Section 1003.4A15 requires the financial institution to report one of the credit scores for the applicant or borrower that was relied on in making the credit decision. In choosing which credit score to report in this circumstance, this comment explains that a financial institution need not use the same approach for its entire HMDA submission, but it should be generally consistent, such as by routinely using one approach within a particular division of the institution or for a category of covered loans. In instances such as these, the financial institution should report the name and version of the credit scoring model for the score reported. Third, what does a financial institution report if there are two or more applicants or borrowers for which it obtained or created a single credit score and it relied on it? In this case, comment 4A15-3 explains that the financial institution reports the credit score for either the applicant or first co-applicant. Otherwise, the financial institution reports the credit score for the applicant that it relied on in making the credit decision, if any, and the credit score for the first co-applicant that it relied on in making the credit decision, if any. Finally, under what circumstances would a financial institution report not applicable for credit score information? Number one, the file was closed for incompleteness or the application was withdrawn before a credit decision was made, even if the financial institution obtained or created a credit score. Number two, the financial institution did not rely on a credit score in making the credit decision. Number three, the covered loan was purchased by the financial institution. Number four, the applicant and if applicable, the co-applicant are not natural persons. Section 1003.4A10 Romanet 3 requires that the financial institution report the gross annual income it relied on in making the credit decision, or if a credit decision was not made, the gross annual income relied on in processing the application. Income information must be rounded to the nearest thousand. What is meant by relied on? When a financial institution evaluates income as part of a credit decision, it reports the gross annual income relied on in making the credit decision. For example, if an institution relies on an applicant's salary to compute a debt-to-income ratio, but also relies on the applicant's annual bonus to evaluate creditworthiness, the institution reports the salary and the bonus to the extent relied upon. If the financial institution relies only on a portion of the gross annual income for its credit decision, then the financial institution reports only that portion of the income that it relied on. If there is an applicant and co-applicant on the application form, and both of them provided their income on the application form, but the financial institution relied only on one of the incomes to evaluate creditworthiness, whether it is the applicants or co-applicants, then the financial institution reports only the income it relied on. What happens if an application is withdrawn before a credit decision is made and therefore the institution did not have the opportunity to use the income it relied on with respect to evaluating an applicant's credit worthiness? In this case, the financial institution reports the income information it relied on in processing the application at the time the application was withdrawn or the file was closed for incompleteness. A financial institution does not include as income amounts considered in making a credit decision based on factors that a financial institution relies on in addition to income, such as annuitized assets or the depletion of an applicant's remaining assets. A financial institution reports not applicable for the income data point in the following scenarios. Number one, under the financial institution's policies and procedures, income is not required to be considered. Number two, the applicant or co-applicant is not a natural person. Examples include a corporation, partnership, or trust. 
Note that if the applicant is a natural person and is the beneficiary of a trust, then the financial institution is required to report income information. Number three, the covered loan or application is secured by or proposed to be secured by a multifamily dwelling. Number four, the covered loan is a purchase loan and the financial institution chooses not to report income. Number five, the applicant or borrower is the financial institution's employee. Section 1003.4A23 requires that the financial institution report the debt to income ratio also known as DTI, of the applicant or borrower if the financial institution relied on it in making the credit decision. DTI is the ratio of the applicant's or borrower's total monthly debt to total monthly income. Comment 4A23 provides that a financial institution relies on the applicant's or borrower's DTI ratio in making the credit decision if it was a factor in the credit decision, even if it was not a dispositive factor. For example, if DTI was one of multiple factors the financial institution considered, it relied on it and reports it even if the financial institution denied the application based on a factor other than DTI. A financial institution reports not applicable for DTI in the following scenarios. Number one, a credit decision was made without relying on DTI. Number two, the application was closed for incompleteness or the application was withdrawn before a credit decision was made even if DTI was calculated. Number three, the applicant and co-applicant, if applicable, are not natural persons. Number four, the covered loan or application is secured or proposed to be secured by a multifamily dwelling. Number five, the covered loan is a purchase loan. Moving on, let's discuss combined loan to value ratio and application channel. Section 1003.4A24 requires that the financial institution report the ratio of the total amount of debt secured by the property to the value of the property relied on in making the credit decision. This is known as the combined loan to value ratio or CLTV. Comment 4A24 provides that a financial institution relies on the CLTV in making the credit decision if the CLTV was a factor in the credit decision even if it was not a dispositive factor. For example, if CLTV was one of multiple factors the financial institution considered, it relied on it and reports it, even if the financial institution denied the application based on a factor other than CLTV. A financial institution reports not applicable for CLTV in the following scenarios. Number one, a credit decision was made without relying on CLTV. Number two, the application was closed for incompleteness or the application was withdrawn before a credit decision was made, even if CLTV was calculated. Number three, the covered loan is a purchased loan. Let's talk about application channel. Section 4A33, Romanet 1 and Romanet 2, requires that the financial institution report whether the applicant or borrower submitted the application directly to the financial institution and whether the obligation arising from the covered loan was, or if it was an application, would have been initially payable to the financial institution. First, let's discuss a couple of scenarios where the application is submitted directly to the financial institution. Number one, an application is submitted directly to the financial institution if the mortgage loan originator was an employee of the financial institution when the loan originator performed activities related to the origination for the covered loan. Number two, an application is submitted directly to the financial institution if the financial institution directed the applicant to a third party agent who performed activities related to the origination on behalf of the financial institution and that third party agent did not assist the applicant with applying for a covered loan with other institutions. When is an application not submitted directly to the institution? An example of when an application is not submitted directly to the institution occurs when an applicant contacts a broker or correspondent and the applicant completes the application and then the broker or correspondent forwarded the application to the financial institution for approval. 
Let's discuss when an application is initially payable to the financial institution. If the obligation was initially payable on the face of the note or contract to the financial institution that is reporting the covered loan or application, then the obligation was initially payable to the financial institution. There are certain scenarios when a financial institution reports that the application channel data point is not applicable. Number one, if the application was withdrawn, denied, or closed for incompleteness, the financial institution had not determined at the time it took final action on the application whether the loan would initially be payable to the financial institution. Number two, the covered loan is a purchased loan. Our final topic for today is automated underwriting systems. Section 4A35, Romanet 1, requires that the financial institution report the name of the automated underwriting system, also known as AUS, that it used to evaluate the application, as well as the result that was generated by the AUS. What is an AUS? Section 4A35, Romanet 2, provides that an AUS is an electronic tool developed by a securitizer, federal government insurer, or federal government guarantor that provides a result regarding both the credit risk of the applicant and whether the covered loan is eligible to be originated, purchased, insured, or guaranteed by that securitizer, federal government insurer, or federal government guarantor. Note that the system must provide a result regarding the credit risk of the applicant and the eligibility of the loan to be originated, purchased, insured, or guaranteed by a securitizer, federal government insurer, or federal government guarantor that developed the system. If a system is an electronic tool that provided a determination of the loan's eligibility for purchase, for example, but the system does not provide an assessment of the creditworthiness of the applicant, then the system is not an AUS for the purposes of HMDA reporting. A financial institution that uses its own proprietary automated underwriting system to evaluate an application must report AUS information, but the financial institution must also be a securitizer in order for the system to meet the definition of an AUS. If a financial institution used more than one AUS to evaluate an application or used a single AUS that generated multiple results, the financial institution must determine which AUS or AUSs and which result or results to report. Here are six steps in order that the financial institution must follow to make that determination. Step number one. Determine whether the AUS it used to evaluate the application matches the loan type it reported for the application or covered loan. Step number two. If the AUS matches the loan type, determine whether the result was obtained from only one AUS. If so, then report the AUS that matches the loan type and the result obtained from that AUS. Step number three. If no AUS was used that matches the loan type, or if more than one result matches the loan type generated by a system that corresponds to the loan type reported, determine whether the AUS used matches the purchaser, insurer, or guarantor for the covered loan. Step number four. If an AUS matches the purchaser, insurer, or guarantor, Determine whether only one result was obtained from that AUS. If only one result from the AUS that matches the purchaser, insurer, or guarantor was obtained, report the AUS that matches and the result obtained from that AUS. Step number five. If no AUS was used that matches the purchaser, insurer, or guarantor, or if multiple results were obtained from an AUS that matches the purchaser, insurer, or guarantor, or loan type, report both the result obtained closest in time to the credit decision and the AUS that generated the result. Step number six. If multiple results were obtained at the same time and the steps above do not apply, 
report all of the results from each of the multiple AUSs obtained and the name of the AUSs that generated each of the results, up to a total of five results and five AUSs. If more than five systems and five results meet the final step, then the financial institution chooses any five among them to report. There are certain scenarios where a financial institution reports not applicable for the AUS data point. Number one, the financial institution did not use an AUS to evaluate the application. Number two, the applicant and co-applicant, if applicable, are not natural persons. Or, number three, the covered loan is a purchased loan. We hope you found this webinar helpful. The Bureau has additional resources to help you understand and comply with the final rule. These are available on the Bureau's website at www.consumerfinance.gov forward slash policy dash compliance forward slash guidance forward slash implementation dash guidance. In addition, the filing instructions guide known as the FIG is available at www.consumerfinance.gov forward slash humda forward slash four dash filers. The FIG is a compendium of resources to help you file the humda data you collect. If you have specific regulatory interpretation questions, you may submit them to CFPB underscore reg inquiries at cfpb.gov. Please specify HMDA in the subject line and provide regulatory sites to indicate the topic of the question. Technical questions about collecting HMDA data in 2017 and later years or reporting HMDA in 2018 and later years should be directed to HMDA help at cfpb.gov. Thank you for joining us in this webinar.